Welcome, welcome, welcome to another Friday Bible study at noon. I'm your host, Pastor Jackie, and uh, I am so glad to uh, be honored to uh, speak today on the topic, Your Present Exists with Your Permission. Your present situation of whatever you may be in or whatever you may be facing exists with your permission. In other words, it has your approval. In other words, it has your consent. So your present exists with your permission. Never complain about what you permit. Never complain about what you permit. So your present exists. Whatever situation you're in, whatever you're facing exists with your permission. You, in other words, you are the only one that can change it. Nobody else. So why complain about it? When you want to change, then you do something about it. If you don't want, if you don't want to change, then you don't have to do anything about it. But anyway, it's with your consent, with your approval. Okay. Now, the first thing we must decide is the conclusion of your life. You got the first thing you need to decide that the clue, the, the uh, conclusion of your life. How do you want your life to end? What is it? You know, what is it that you want so that you desire? What is your outcome? What is your desired results? Only you can determine that. Now, secondly, once you have the, decide the conclusion of your life, now Seth, you must decide <clears throat> to run your own race. You must decide to run your own race, your own race. Now, you cannot complain or blame anyone but yourself what you allow. You know, that's the first thing. Like Paul said, we want to be like Paul. Paul is a perfect example. This is what Paul did in 2 Timothy 4 and 7. Paul said, I have fought a good fight. He said, I have finished my course. He said, I have kept the faith. In other words, Paul said, uh, was saying, nobody else fought my fight. Nobody else could finish my course. Nobody else could run my race. I kept the faith. I kept my focus. I fought my fight. And that's exactly what Paul did. He said, I did it. And, and he had proof. And that's the same thing we're going to have to, uh, when we stand before God, we have to have that same attitude of mindset. I fought this fight. I finished my court. It was a lot of obstacles in my way, a lot of things I faced, but I kept the faith. I didn't throw in the towel. I kept going. And so even though when you God gives you something, you uh, it's, you may have days and times that you want to just throw in the towel and quit, but you can't. You got to keep going. And I'm gonna, as we go on, I'm going to tell you why. Paul says, and everything's not going to be easy. Just because you call don't mean you're not going to face any obstacles, but God has equipped you for that. Second Corinthians 11, 23 to 29, Paul said, are they servants of Christ? He said, I have worked harder. I, he's looking, Paul said, oh, everything I went through, but I still finished. I've been put in prison more often. I've been whipped times without number. And he said, and face death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times he said I was shit ridden. Not one time, but three times. Once he said, he said one time I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. And I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the desert, and on the seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. He said, I have worked hard and long in doing many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Then, besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my feeling, uh, feeling that weakness? 
who is led astray and I do not burn with anger. He said, even though Paul went through all of this that I just read you uh, for error, all of this, he finished his assignment. He didn't throw in a child. It wasn't easy, but he had to, God had gave him the grace and ability to continue and go through. But I believe that Paul discovered and experienced the grace of God on his life. And I believe that is one of, one of the reasons why Paul kept going. Once he found out about God's grace and God's divine influence on his life and the ability was there for him to do what he uh, he had to do, even though he faced all of those situations, he still did not quit because of he tapped into God's grace. So when you tap into God's grace, when you tap into his divine influence and ability, you're going to keep going. Not only thing God needs is your will. Now, Lord, I'll do what you want me to do because he said, I have already supplied you the ability and the strength for you to do what I have called you to do. And so, it was the anointing that's going to do it, uh, particularly, and that's why it's best to get into the anointing, find out, discover what God has called you to do, because whatever God has called you to do, you're going to find out that's where your anointing lies, and that's what's going to help you do what God called you to do. So the same thing with just like Paul, the same thing with you and I. You're only God. You are the only one God has anointed for your specific assignment. Yeah. Nobody else. Nobody yeah. can discern it for you. Nobody else can pursue it for you. Nobody else can complete it for you. You are responsible for completing your assignment. That is very important. So it's, you, when you go before God, you want to go with, with the fact, no, you don't want to go before God. I didn't know. You better try to find out and discover because whatever he has called you to do, there is an anointing for you to do it. Amen. Romans 14 and 12 says amplified. It says, and so each of you, each of you, myself, everybody, and so each of you shall give an account of himself. Now, I can't give an account for my husband. He can't give an account for me. In fact, he's not going to even be standing up there with me. I will be facing God all by myself. And he said, give an, uh, and you're going to have, in other words, you're going to have to give an answer in reference to the judgment to God. In other words, there's going to be some personal accountability. Okay? 2 Corinthians 5 and 10 says, For we believers will be called to account. And must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So that each one may be repaid. See, we're going to be repaid. We're looking for a reward down here for man. He says, I'm going to pay, pay you. God said, you must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So each one may be repaid for what has been done in the body. Whether good or bad, that is, each will be held responsible for his actions. Purposes, goals, motives, and the use or misuse of his time, opportunities and abilities. And I was going to say, what did you do with the opportunity I gave you? What did you do with all that time I gave you? What Did you find out your purpose? Did you discover your purpose? He said, all the this is what we got to one day give account to God. And I take it serious. I used to... Not take it serious, but I take it serious now because I know one day I have to face the man. So, now what we're going to be asked, did we do what we wanted to do or did we do what he assigned us to do? That's a big difference. Did we do what we wanted to do or did we do what he assigned us to do? Because a lot of times God may call you as a, a deacon. He may call you as a, a ministry or a nursery worker or whatever, Sunday school teacher. And maybe you may say, I don't want to do that. I don't, I don't want to be a Sunday school teacher. I don't want to be a, a work in a nursery. I don't want to uh, be a deacon. I don't want to be an usher. I want to do this over here because it seems more glamorous. But you don't have the anointing to do that. You have the anointing to do what God have called you to do. And so that's what, so you're not going to get any rewards or any pay for what you did, what you wanted to do. You're only going to get paid for that he had called, he has called you to do. So 1 Corinthians 3, 13 and 15 said, there is going to come a time of testing at Christ's judgment day to see what kind of material, I like this illustration, what kind of material each builder has used 
Everyone's work will be put through the fire so that all can see whether or not it keeps its value and what was really accomplished. Then every workman who has built on the foundation with the right materials, and that's what, what God has called you to do, and whose work still stands will get his pay. But if the house he has built burn up, he will have a great loss. He himself will be saved, but like, but like a man escaping through a wall of fame. But anyway, the Bible says, well, if you do something that he didn't tell you to do, even though you did it, he said you're not going to get paid for it if you do something that he didn't tell you to do. And so it's a lot of people doing things God has not even told them to do. You're not going to get any reward for it. You're only going to get rewarded for that he has called you to do. And that's very important. It's very important to stay in your lane. You only got grace for your lane. You get outside of your lane, you, there no, won't be any grace and you're not going to get any rewards and you're not going to get paid for it. It's just tell them out to somebody coming and start cutting my grass and then they looking for me to pay them. I'm not going to pay you for going out there to cut my grass. I didn't ask you to cut my grass. I didn't ask you to trim my hedges. You know, I didn't ask you to come in to clean my house. And you did all that on your own without asking me, but then you get no pay for that. But on the other hand, if I ask you to do, do housekeeping or cook or whatever, then it's my obligation to pay you. And that's the same way God says, if you do what you've been called to do, then you're going to get paid for that and nothing else. You're not going to get paid for stuff I didn't ask you to do. Okay, God never intended for you to depend on anyone in order for you to do what he assigned you to do. That's why he gave you his grace, his divine ability to assist you in getting the job done. A lot of people saying if Susie was here, if John was here, you know I can do it. No, 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 no. You cannot go before God and say, well, the people didn't come out, the people didn't support me, the people talked about me, the people said they didn't want to hear me, the people, the people, people. That's what got, got Saul in trouble, the people. Instead of doing what God called him to do, he said the people caused him not to do what God told him to do. So don't depend on anyone. Depend on God. If he called you, then he's going to support you in there. And I know for example, when God called you to do something, there may not be nobody out there. You may not, you, we're going to find out later on when we go. You may not be nobody believing in your dream. It may not be nobody be, uh, believing what God told you to do. That's why God said if you have faith, have it to yourself because maybe nobody may not believe in it. They look at you, oh, I don't believe God called you to do that, not you. That's why you don't need to tell nobody that you need to do it. That's what got Joseph in trouble. He had a dream. He told his brothers. His brothers was even jealous of him and they, and, and they, uh, they sought to kill him. But even though Joseph had to go through a lot of un necessary things because he opened his mouth and told the wrong people under the guise of sharing, you know, something that God has told him. So when God gives you something, it, it seems impossible. It's bad enough to seem impossible for you. How are you going to tell somebody else? And so that's what he got in trouble. But eventually the vision did come to pass. The dream did come to pass, but not without difficulty. He had to go through a lot. And so, but at the end, they believed in it. So get, in other words, get the dream working for you. Get what God told you. You start working. You start doing it. And then the people come later. Okay. Galatians 6 and 4 says, each of you must examine your own actions. You got to not someone else's action, but he say examine your own action. Then you can be proud of your own accomplishments without comparing yourself to others. I know the pastor always say, tell people, don't compare me to another minister. Don't compare me to another pastor. You know, you know, this is my daughter. This is how God gave me to. He, God gave me to do. He didn't give me to get healing lines. He didn't give me to uh, have $500, $500 lines or $200, whatever. He called me to do this. I have anointing for this. So you got to be very careful that you stay within the framework that God has called you. Because if you Amen. don't, you try to be doing like what they're doing over at so-and-so church. And you're going to get out your anointing. Plus, you're not going to get any reward for it. And plus, you you, try, you think if I do what so-and-so do, the people are like me. The people will come. No, not necessarily so. They're, they're, I don't know about you, but there is a personal satisfaction 
blessing that I get when I know that I'm doing what God has called me to do. Because for years, it took me a long time to even discover what God wanted me to do. And then once I discovered it, even to do it. And so once you get in line and begin to do to work, I don't know about you, when you begin to do and get in that calling, get in your lane, get in your assignment, there is a personal satisfaction that you get. And the only reason I would say you're comparing yourself with somebody else because you ain't satisfied with what God is giving you. It's like if you get married and you got a man, but you won't and you won't you jealous of the other person's husband or wife or family. What's wrong with you? That means you're not satisfied with your own man that you got that God gave you. You picked him. Be satisfied with it. You know, don't be looking at and then you with the sly self want to praise the other man and talk about all the stuff he's doing and what yours ain't doing. That's not going to work either. So anyway, you need to be uh, satisfied and pleased with what God has given you because what you see is not always the case. You know, it's like you think the grass is green on the other side until you get over there and you find out, oh, my God, that grass is worse than mine. But anyway, you, you got to stay in your lane of anointing. And if, if the church, if everyone stayed in their lane of anointing, it'll be a much better place. Don't let nobody intimidate you and get you out the spot where God has anointed you to be in. And you want to be like uh, it, uh, Jesus is our, example, uh, is our example. He said in John 17 and 4, he said, I have glorified you on the earth by completing down to, he said, the last detail what you assigned me to do. He said, I have completed this was what Jesus said, said the Father, I've completed down to the last detail everything that you have called me to do. He said, now, Father, glorify me with the same glory that I had before I came down here. So he said, I've finished the work. I've finished my assignment. And people don't realize that if you're still here and you're born again, Christian, and you're alive, that you're on assignment. God has told you specifically something to do. I don't care if it's me standing at the door. I don't care if it's... You, you know what it is, but anyway, you're down here for a reason, and God give you ample space and time to carry it out. Amen. Now, there are going to be four things that I, I, I believe that can move us from, a, from the discomfort into our assignment. Four things. Four things from discomfort in, uh, into your assignment. And act number one is, does your daily schedule, what you do every day on a daily basis, does your daily schedule reveal you have honored your priorities in the eyes of God. Does your daily schedule, things that you do every day, reveal that you have honored your priorities in the eyes of God? In other words, if you have not maximized your life into the present, you are unqualified. You are unqualified to enter into your future. If you haven't done nothing in your present, then you'll never be qualified to go into your present. In other words, you'll never be promoted. You'll never be promoted because you, you haven't done what God has told you to do over here. Then once you do that and you faithfully in that, then he'll bless you with more. The scripture, uh, Luke 16 at 10, uh, I always like the word to back up everything. It says, whoever is faithful in, a sm in, in, in small matters will be faithful in large ones. Whoever is dishonest in small matters will be dishonest in large ones. In other words, you say, if you have not been faithful in handling worldly wealth, how can you be trusted with true wealth? You can't. The answer is you can't. And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to someone else, who will give you what belongs to you? No one, because you're not ready. And so you, you're not ready for your own because you have not been faithful. So God wants to bless his people. He wants to give them responsibility. He wants them to do some things, but they, they, they're not faithful. They can't be trustworthy. You, uh, they, won't, they won't be faithful in that which God has given them. And so as a result, they're stuck right there. They can't be promoted. Uh, I think Philip was a deacon and he was promoted to evangelist because he was faithful. So God do uh, uh, believe in promotion and we'll promote you but you got to be faithful where you are and so I believe uh, does your daily schedule reveal 
uh, honor your priorities in the eyes of God. In other words, if you have not maximized your, your present, then you now you are unqualified to move into your future. It's not going to happen. Now, the second thing I believe is spending time in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Spending time in the presence to hear his voice. The Bible says, my sheep hear my voice and a stranger my sheep hear my voice, and a stranger they will not follow. So the Holy Spirit is our mentor and advisor, but in order to recognize his voice, you're going to have to spend time in his presence. And so the, the Holy Spirit says in John 14, Amplified, he says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter, counselor, the Holy Spirit is going to be your counselor. It's going to be your helper. It's going to comfort you. It's going to be your intercessor. It's going to be your advocate. In other words, he's going to support you. It's going to strengthen you, and it's going to stand by you, that he may remain with you forever. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. That's why you want the Holy Spirit, because it's going to do all those things. It's going to comfort you. It's going to counsel you, help you, and it's going to be your intercessor so you can get the job done and do what God has called you to do. It's the spirit of truth. It say, whom the world cannot receive, welcome, take to his heart, because it does not see him or know and recognize him. But guess what? It say, but you know and recognize him, for he lives with you constantly and will be in you. Well, when the comforter, the counselor, your counselor, your helper, your advocate, your intercessor, your strengthener, your standby come, whom he say, I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who comes, proceeds from the Father, he himself will testify regarding me. He's going to reveal to you. He's going to tell you what to do or what you shouldn't do. In other words, he's going to be your guide. So you can't be successful in what God called you to do. So you're going to have to spend some time listening to the whole voice of the Holy Spirit. Get quiet before God after you have prayed. Then spend some time. Just get quiet before God. Get a pen and get a pad and be, and be ready to write down what God is speaking what he said because he said he's going to reveal to you. He's going to tell you some things that you need to do. Maybe you know he's called you in a particular position, whatever, and you don't know what to do, but you sit down quiet and get your pad, and then he's going to guide you, he's going to instruct you, and he's going to tell you everything what you need to do so you can be a success. Now, so spend time, that's number two, spend time in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Not just do all the talking, then once you get your prayer, then you go. Stop. Wait a minute. He wants to say something. And so be ready to listen. The third thing is, are you living in disobedience to the known will of God? And you know the will of God is his word. So if you are walking in contradiction to what God has told you to do, expect painful experiences on the road ahead. If you are walking in a contradiction to the, what God has told you to do, there will be painful uh, experiences on the road ahead. You cannot just do what you want to do. And particularly, this is what I'm talking about a moment ago to Jonah. It is so good when you don't do what God tells you to do. It says, Jonah 1 through 4, it says, Now the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord came unto Jonah. And so the word of God specifically came unto Jonah and the son of Amittai, saying, Arise. These are his instructions. He said, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. In other words, they're about to be judged. If there is, don't be some changing. He said, But Jonah rose. But when God told him to go in, 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 in the, uh, to the city and speak against their wickedness, yeah. guess what he do? The third verse said, But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarsha from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarsha, so he paid the fare thereof and went down 
into it to go with them unto Tosha from the presence of the Lord. How I many know you can't run from God when he have told you to do something? Mm -hmm. He God tell them specific what I want you to do? He said, I, I don't want to do that. I'm going another, I'm going somewhere. I'm going to another city. I, I'm not going to do it. But guess what the fourth verse said? But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea and there was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the ship was about to be broken. I tell you, when you got a call of God on your life, you can't run. The David said, if I go and make my bed in hell, he's there. Wherever I go, if I go up to the mountain, wherever I'm, he's there. So he tried to hide, run from God. How many know you cannot run from God? And so some would say, well, Jonah was given a difficult job to do. So I was, I was going to figure out what is it that would that, what type of people did Jonah, what type of city was God asking him to do? Because, you know, God won't, that's what God gives you ability in your particular assignment so you can do what he has called you to do. So picture this. Uh, he would look at the things I want you to picture what this man had to face. And, and this, this is who he had to preach to. And so he said, I guess Jonah said, I heard about that city and you want me to go preach to them people? You know, you want me to go tell them, you know, uh, about you? And so, and I'm just, so maybe if you was in Jonah's shoes, maybe you would have done the same thing. Because it's a lot of time God tell people, go to the prison. I don't want to go to go to the prison. Well, go to the, I go to the hospital, go to the convalescent home. I don't want to go to the prison. I don't want to go to the convalescent home. I don't want to go on the streets. I, I don't want to go. I don't want to talk to the drug dealer. I don't want to talk to that prostitute. She may try to get my man. I don't want to talk to that prostitute. I don't want to talk to that drug dealer. I mean, and so it's like things that we don't do, yet you have been given, uh, that's your assignment, you have been given God's ability to do it. And so Nahum, but I want you to picture the people he had to witness to. Uh, Nahum 3, 1 to 4 says, he said, woe to Nineveh, city of blood. It was a city of blood. Remind me of Chicago, See, what it say, a city of blood. It say, full of lies, cr crammed with plunder. Listen. They say, listen, hear the crack of the whips. You know, when you somebody whooping something, d d hear the crack of whips as the chariots rush forward against her. Wheels rumbling. You know the wheels? Wheels rumbling. Horses, horses' hoofs pounding and chariots ch clattering as they bump wildly through the streets. See the flashing swords and glittering spears in the upraised arms of the cavalry. This is a whole cavalry rushing through the street, whooping people with whips and stuff. It said, dead, the dead, this is what he probably could stomach. It said, the dead are lying in the streets. Picture that now. God telling you to go to the city of blood where the dead are lying in the streets. Bodies. It said, heaps of bodies. Everywhere, just dead bodies all over, everywhere just heaped up. Not one, not two, just many hundreds of just dead bodies just piled all up in the street, everywhere it went. And you, you couldn't walk for stumbling over a body. It said men stumble over them, scramble to their feet and fall again because there were so many bodies. They were walking, then they were stumbling and fall, and then they would get back up because you know how something is in your way blocking, and you hit it, and then you fall, and then they get back up again. And then it says, all, all this because Nineveh sold herself to the enemies of God. The beauty and faintly city, mistress of dead charm, deadly charm, enticed the nation with her beauty, then taught them all to worship her false god, bewitch the people everywhere. So anyways, the people had been witched. They, was, they had left God, and they had this uh, spirit in the form of a, a Jezebel spirit it was bewitching the people everywhere, and then taught them how to worship false god, and took them away from their God. And so they needed to hear the gospel. The only way people are going to get free, somebody got to teach the gospel. Somebody they got to hear the gospel. And somebody got to go packing the power and anointing of God. Go to where the gun told folks at, the knife told people, the razor carrying people, the, the people that will curse y'all. Somebody have anointed. Don't you go. If you ain't been anointed to, to go, don't you go. Only the people who've been anointed to go into them 
places, to go into the prison, to go into the jailhouses, to go into the whole house, to go to the crackhead, to go to the drug dealer. Those people have got, and certain people got an anointing for that. And so that's why they can go and not be in fear that somebody going to kill them or cut them or do anything to them. They have anointing to do it. And now, God, apparently God gave Jonah the anointing to deal with those people that call in the name of the city, even though it's near it, but it has a nickname, the Blood City, because they, there were so many dead bodies everywhere. And so... Uh, but God wanted the people free. Even though they was in that mess that they had gotten themselves in, God wanted them free. The, the scripture said, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So Jonah 1 and 7 said, Now the Lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. When you run away from the Lord, you never get to you never get to where you're going. So Jonah never did get to where he was going. He was on his way to uh, Joppa, <coughs> and he never did get there. God is everywhere, and you cannot hide from God. But and Jonah soon found out he was going to, he was trying to hide tail out of country even after God had told him what to do. So let me see, Jonah two nine and ten says. I did. Now he's in a fish's belly. He been he been there for three days and three nights. He don't had time to think over, do some talking to God, do some repenting to get his mind made up whether he gonna obey God or not. So the two and nine and ten say, I will never worship. And he's this Jonah talking now inside the well belly. I will never worship anyone but you. For how can I think? For how can I thank you enough for all, for all you have done? Now, this is John talking. He said, I will surely, oh, now, now he's talking, now, John. He said, I will surely fulfill my promises, for my deliverance comes from the Lord alone. He knows that he won't go get delivered out of that well, baby. He won't go be free unless he fulfill the, uh, the will of God. And so it's a lot of people there in situations, and uh, they, they wonder why the sickness is upon them, uh, this condition is upon them, uh, certain things happening to them, because you is out of the will of God. You're in disobedience, and so, and you're not, and you're not gonna get well. You're not gonna be uh, uh, until you begin to do what God say do. Same as Jonah, he made up his mind. Father, you're the only one I'm gonna worship. I'm gonna fulfill my assignment. I'm gonna do what you call me to do. Soon as I get up out of here, just let me up out of this fish belly, and I'm gonna do what you call me to do. So as soon as Jonah acknowledged his transgression. He said, he said, I'm going to fulfill my assignment. And then guess what? He was released from the whale's belly. And so I don't know what type of situation you're in, what whale's belly you're in, but I tell you what, you can get out just like Jonah got out when you make up your mind, I'm going to do what God called me to do. I'm not going to let nobody hinder me from doing what God has called you. You wonder why people in certain conditions because they in disobedience to what God told them to do. They know what God told them to do. So until they make up their mind that they're going to do what God told them to do, then they're going to remain in that situation. Situation. And it's unfortunate, even though Jonas was three days and three nights, some people remain in bad situations 10, 15, and 20 years, and they never come out because they never can make up their mind that they're going to do what God called them to do. But that's a dangerous thing to be in. They say, the, uh, the third verse say, Then the Lord spoke to Jonah again. See, he didn't get no different message. He said, Go to that great city, Nineveh. He said, and warned them of their doom as I told you to before. He said, and just like I told you in the beginning, I'm going to tell you again, go to the city of Nineveh and warn them of their impending doom. So Jonah obeyed and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city with many villages around it. So, Lord, that it would take three days. The city was so big that it would take three days to walk through it. It say, but the very first day when Jonah entered the city and began to preach to people, 
repenting. So the very first day he went there, the people would begin to, when they heard the word of God, when they heard the gospel, they preached. Jonah shouted to the crowds and gathered around him. Forty days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. And they believed him and declared a fast from the king on down. Everyone put on sackcloth, the rough, coarse garments, Worn at times of mourning, so everybody put uh got on got, got put on sackcloth and ashes, and they began to print because they uh, repent because they believed the man of God that impending danger and doom was going to destroy them if they had repented. The Bible says warning always comes before destruction. So if you see somebody being destroyed, you better believe they have had a warning. Okay, the fourth thing uh, that I want to say is the future you are designed. Is the future you are designed worth the investment of preparation? So whatever you desire to do, is it worth the investment of preparation? See, you are not born qualified in the sense that you do not have to prepare, study, pray, read. You must become qualified. In other words, you got to prepare yourself. Uh, you, you say, oh, you, oh, I'm anointed, so God is going to use God is going to use me for everything. You may be anointed, but he, you know, you won't be prepared. The Bible says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a uh, worry that needed not to be shamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So you can't think just because you're anointed and called that you just gonna stand up there and then God just gonna speak. Through you. No, no, no. That's not going to happen. You got to study. You got to get the word of God in you. The ability of God will come upon you to assist you to do what God has called you to do. In other words, when you think that you're calling, you won't study, think God just going to, the anointing just going to flow through you. It tell him out to God say he'll bring back everything to remembrance. But he can't bring nothing back to your remembrance if you have studied. You know, you think you stand up there waiting for God to bring back to your remembrance and you ain't studied nothing. What he gonna bring back to your remembrance when you ain't studied and you're not prepared? But that's what it's telling them out to do. But Colossians 1 23 says, if you continue in the face, you gotta continue in the face. You can't be in and out. It's like planting a flower and take pulling up off the ground. Planting a flower, putting it up and pulling it up. Plan and pull it. Well, when you're, not, you're never going to receive a harvest. You're not going anywhere. But it say, but if you continue in the faith, ground it and settle, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, wherefore I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ, in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Wherefore, he said, I am made a minister. This is the part I want to get to. Paul said, I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. This word made in the Greek means cause to be. I'm going to cause you to be a minister, uh, to me to become to come into being, to come to pass. You don't take the credit for it. God said, I'm going to cause you to be a minister. I'm going to cause this thing to come about. I'm going to give, I'm going to get the glory. But, but you're going to still have to prepare yourself. So you say, why is there so much preparation? Why is there so much preparation? So you can continue and not quit. Because there's too many people there, they start and they quit. And they don't continue because of whatever. I'm going to list some, some things, some of the things that people quit on and they stop. That's why you need to uh, prepare yourself. Everybody God called, he didn't just send them. He may call you, but it may be 10 years before he sent you. Maybe five years before he, he sent you. But just because he called you does mean, not mean that he sent you. There is a reason for that. So you can take the time and prepare and live in it and walk in it and get it working for you. For I, man, I was wondering why for many years God never did use me. And I never did get chances to do anything. He said, you don't know anything. You got to work it. You got to get into the word, work it, get a revelation on the word, a, work, a working knowledge of the word. Get it working for you. Start living it. Let it develop in you. You let the, let the fruit develop in you. Let joy, peace, so when everything comes, you won't just go down with the flow. Everything happened. You go in so-and-so. That's how I used to be. Where's Jackie gone? 
Well, what, what's she mad about now? I don't know. But that's how I used to be, you know, until I got developed, got this word working in me. And so God couldn't trust me. He don't know what was going to be the next month. He didn't know what was going to be the next week. He didn't know if I was going to blow off the handle. He didn't know if I was going to tell somebody else. He didn't know what I was going to do. So he's not going to, she can't trust me. Even though I was called to do certain things, he couldn't put it into my hand because I couldn't be trusted. Okay, the Hebrew word season, this is very important, is moed. Uh, moed, the Hebrew word season, S-E-A-S-E-A-S-O-N, uh, is moed. It's uh, an appointed time, a set time, a decreed time, like spring, summer, fall, and winter. You know, they don't last, but you still got to go through them. <laughs> the season don't last, but you still got to go through You still got to go, go through them. So here we got to go through winter before we can get to spring. Got to go through spring before we can get to the uh, summer. And then before we got to go through summer, before we get fall, even though they don't last, you still got to go. That's how it is. So in, in when you are, God has called you and preparing you, there's there going to be seasons of affliction. A word affliction in the Greek means to suffer hardship in company with me be partaker of affliction. You're gonna go through something. You know, it's no, it's not. You can say I'm saved and stay in, in the, go on a fast and pray and do whatever you want. You're gonna have to go through something. Paul said, "Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner." Paul was in prison. He said, well, "I'm a prisoner." But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. A lot of people they don't want to be talked about. They don't want they want everybody to agree with them. So they won't take the share of the afflictions of the gospel. And so they never end. They never do what God called them to do. They say, according to the power of God, you have to continue to preach regardless of the circumstances. So circumstances may not be good, but you still got to preach anyway. You got to preach to find like you're preaching to a thousand. You gotta preach to a uh, one like you're doing, like it's the, the whole uh, 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 building is full. And don't get discouraged. And so they want to endure their affliction. They just want to grow up overnight and it don't work that way. You got to go through something. It puts people, they get take time for people character to develop in you. They need to know what you like. They don't know you. Well, they need to see something in you. And the Bible says, endure hardness as a good soldier. And then there are going to be seasons of ignorance. You know, that's why you have to, the Bible says, study to show that self approved of the God of work we need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So you got to be ready to give people an answer of the hope that is in you. A lot of times people ask us something we don't know. We don't know because you haven't studied. And you, you haven't, oh God. And then you have to. Uh, I, uh, you have to study and get into the Word and pray and prepare yourself. Okay, then there are going to be seasons of contention. Uh, the ser uh, but even though it be seasons of contention, the Bible says the servant of the Lord must not be, must not participate, participate in quarrels, arguments. Oh, my God. Oh, man. You know, I look back and I was the time we kind, I even told my husband, I'm not taking nothing off of nobody, so I hope them people leave me alone, because they, if they don't leave me alone, I'm going to get them off of me. You know how we say, I'm going to get them off of me. I'm not taking nothing. I'm not, and that's bad quarrels. The Bible say, don't participate in quarrels. All right, I was right in the middle. <laughs> don't participate in quarrels. I'm right in the middle. <laughs> You see, but must be kind to everyone. Oh, I'm not going to be kind to them. They talked about me. They talked about my mother. They talked about my husband. They talked about my shoes. They talked about, they talked about my hair. I'm not going to be kind to them, but God said, you got to be kind to them anyway. Be kind to everyone. Even tempered. Oh, my God. Even tempered. You don't even tempered. You know, you don't know from one, not from one day to the next, from one hour to the next, a person tempered. What they mad at now? Who they mad at now? Who upset you? What you upset about now? Oh my God, you got to be even tempered that no matter what, particularly in the gospel and the ministry, whatever happened, you got to remain the same. And then you wonder why people don't want to come around you. You're not even tempered. They don't know what you're going to do. You mad. They don't know what's going to trigger you off. What's going to set you off. What you mad about now. What you don't like now. Who you're rolling your eyes at now. Oh my God. Who you bypassing now and not speaking. So you got to be even tempered. He said preserving peace. Preserving, preserving peace. I'm not preserving no peace. He said, but well, we got to be the ones to preserve peace. And he must be skilled in teaching, patient, 
and tolerant when wrong. When somebody do you wrong, willing to suffer wrong. No, they did me wrong. I'm not going, I'm bad, I'm bad. They did, you just count the times, how many times you have done people wrong. But anyway, he said, willing to suffer wrong. We're not willing to suffer wrong. No, I'm not willing. I used to say, I'm not willing to suffer wrong. I have suffered enough. I am not suffering no more. I'm not taking nothing out for nobody. I am not suffering no more wrong. If any wrong, it's going to be me doing the wrong. Wrong, bad attitude. And God, that's why God can't use you. He must correct those who are in opposition with courtesy. Oh, my God. I'm going to correct him all right, but it's not going to be with no courtesy. I'm boom, boom, I'm telling this. I don't like it. I don't like it. You did. Uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. But he said you got to correct it. We can share that they wrong, but correct. There is a way to correct people. There is correct, cor what is it, corrective uh, criticism, yeah, it's a way to co constructive criticism. You, it's a way people they don't mind you correcting them, but it's how you came to them. Don't come on me like that. Don't come up to me like that. I'm grown too, and they grown too, and they paying their own way, and you're not paying their bills. And you're gonna talk to them like they, like they your kid, a child, or something. They're not gonna take that. There is a way to correct people. It say he must correct those who are in opposition with courtesy and gentleness. In the what? In the hope that they may grant, they re, they will repent. See, you want if you want somebody to repent, then you it's a way you go to them. But if you ain't expected for them to repent, then you don't care. They, you say take it or leave it. You know, take it or leave it. Take take or leave it. So they left it. You know, and you still stuck. But it say they may grant that they repent and be led to the knowledge of the truth, accurately understanding and welcome it. I mean, this is a a scripture for me. And that they may come to their sister and escape from the trap of the, of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. This is my scripture from me. Uh, and, and I'm not blaming because I've come out of certain denomination, but it is just certain things. You got to be even tempered, and it's just certain things that you, you, have, to, you, have, you, have, you have to give to God. You just got to be even tempered. And the last thing is seasons of isolation. Sometimes you can't be around nobody. Sometimes they're gonna be, it's going to be isolation where nobody don't even want to be around you. It says, 2 Timothy 4, 16 and 17, it says, if, this is Paul say, the great man of Paul. He said, in my first trial, he said, no one supported me as an advocate. I stood with me. But they all deserve me. So when God calls you to do something, don't expect a crowd. Don't expect for people to be there to support you and tell you, pat you on the back and telling you, telling you you're doing a good job and you're okay. No, you got to be convinced that God has told you to do that and you're going on even if you're going to have to go by yourself because God has graced you and given you the ability to do it. He said, Paul said, they all deserted me. But he said, but, but, but he said, may it not be counted against them by God. He said, God, don't count this, this against them. He said, but the, he said, you know why? He said, but the Lord stood by me and strengthened and empowered me so that through me the gospel message might be fully proclaimed and that all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was rescued out of the mouth of the lion. He said, even though everybody forsook me, God stood with me. That's who you want. Even if everybody leaves you, you want God. As long as God don't leave, me, leave you, you're going to be okay. And last, it said, the goal is a full reward. So at the end, we can get a full reward. The last scripture, 2 John 1 and 8, NLT, uh, New Living Translation said, Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked so hard to achieve. So you need to watch out that you don't lose all that time, all those years that you have labored. You need to watch out that you don't lose what you have worked so hard to achieve. Because you, be, you, can, you can lose it overnight. It don't take a lot of people, just one person to come and say the wrong thing. Don't allow that person or anyone else to cause you to miss out. That's what happened to uh, Moses. He missed out in going to the promised land because some people, with one too many, said one thing too many to him. And he, and he, he did disobey God and didn't. Uh, failed to reverence God and honor God in front of the people. He told them what to do. He didn't do it. And guess what? God said, I'm going to allow you to look in, but you ain't going in. You can look, or you can look. You can look, but you're not going into the promised land with them. And so God uh, buried Moses. But anyway, he, uh, he lost his full reward. He didn't get a full reward. And so if we don't be careful, we're not going to get a full reward if we allow people to, because uh, people is something else. The devil sent them. 
and they will cause you to just miss out, throw in the towel, and quit. He said, but he said, be diligent so that you receive your full award. So I just want to admonish you to be diligent so you can receive your full reward. And the scripture say, be thou faithful unto death. You can't stop. You could be doing it 10 years and just stop and just quit. But it said, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of righteousness. There is a crown of righteousness waiting in heaven for me, and I know that the Lord will reward me on this day of righteous judgment. And this crown, Paul is saying, is not only waiting for me, but for all who love and long for his unveiled, or long for his coming. It's not on Paul said, it ain't only for me, but it's for all those that uh who love and long for his coming. So God he has a full reward waiting on us. But you can't quit. You gotta keep going. Stay in your side, stay with your assignment, be satisfied with your assignment, and then God will give you the divine ability to press on and keep going. And so until then, God bless you. See you next well, see you soon.